Hi there. I'm Saptarshi Bandhupadhyay, a robotics technologist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab in California. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope on the far side of the moon. This project has been made possible by this incredible team shown here. Now let's dive deeper into this concept. This image shows the LCRT concept. We deploy a 350 meter diameter reflector and feed system in a 1.3 kilometer diameter crater. In NIAC phase one, we were planning to build a one kilometer diameter telescope in a three to five kilometer diameter crater. During NIAC phase two, we reduced LCRT size to 350 meter diameter since we proved that it was possible to obtain the science with this smaller size. The atmospheric absorption figure shows that wavelengths longer than 10 meters cannot be absorbed from Earth because they are scattered and reflected by the ionosphere. Even Earth orbiting satellites cannot observe in this band because of Earth based noises. Hence, these wavelengths have not been explored by humans till date. LCRT will observe the universe in the 6 to 64 meter wavelength band or 4.7 to 47 megahertz frequency band. Since LCRT is on the far side of the moon, the moon acts as a physical shield that isolates LCRT from radio interference from Earth based sources, ionosphere earth orbiting satellites and sun's radio emissions during the lunar night. The figure on the right shows the strong noise sources from earth and sun that have been observed by the wind instrument on the wave spacecraft. The moon protects LCRT from these noise sources and also solar system noise sources like Jupiter and Saturn. Later we will show how LCRT deals with the galactic foreground noise. LCRT will be one of the largest field aperture telescopes in the solar system, larger than the former Arecibo Observatory, but smaller than the Chinese FAST telescope. We first dive deeper into the science objectives of LCRT. The evolution of universe from the Big Bang in the left to present day on the right is shown here. The cosmic microwave background radiation is being studied by Kobe, WMAP, and Planck. Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope are observing the early galaxies. Several ground-based observatories are also observing in this region. But currently there is no data about the dark ages, cosmic dawn and reionization phases of the evolution of the universe. The region of the universe that we have been able to observe has resulted in a number of Nobel Prizes and Gruber Prizes in cosmology. I believe Nobel Prize worthy science is waiting to be discovered in this unobserved region of the universe. LCRT will observe this unobserved region of the universe. Note that there are a number of other mission concepts also under study. These include sparse dipolar concepts like far side and far view and satellite constellations around the moon or at earth moon L2 point like DARE and ALFAR. During the dark ages, the universe was pretty simple, consisting mainly of neutral hydrogen, photons and dark matter. The 21 centimeter signal from the hyperfine transition of neutral hydrogen is multiplied by the cosmological redshift of the dark rages, which is now visible in the ultra long radio wavelength band like 10 meters or more. LCRT will observe the global absorption spectrum of the highly redshifted 21 centimeter neutral hydrogen line. The image on the right shows our best understanding of the 21 centimeter line as a function of cosmological redshift of frequency. Going towards the left on this plot means going further back in time. The signal from the dark ages and first stars are supposed to arrive at different frequencies as shown in this plot. The dotted line is the best theoretical cosmological model of the early universe without any astronomical sources like stars or galaxies. Recent measurements using the edges instrument in Australia have constrained the signal from the dark ages. Different cosmology models have been proposed to account for these measurements. But there are large variations in the predictions of the signal strength from the dark ages among these models. LCRT will collect data about dark ages to further improve these cosmology models. Thus the 21 centimeter line allows us to track the evolution of the universe at different redshifts. This is different from the cosmic microwave background radiation which is essentially a measurement as a single redshift. We hope that LCRT's data will help constrain or bound our understanding of fundamental aspects of the universe like state of the intergalactic medium, dark matter physics and inflation. 
The recent astrophysics decadal survey states that a 21 centimeter line of the dark ages is an important discovery area for the next decade. This slide shows the science traceability matrix for LCRT that shows the science goals on the left and LCRT's instrument performance and mission requirements on the right. Let's now focus on the technology aspects of LCRT. Of course, the idea of building an Arecibo type telescope on the moon has been around since the 1960s. Here is an illustration from 1984 showing such a telescope concept. But specific technical challenges were identified that made an Arecibo type telescope on the moon infeasible. They said that selection of an existing lunar crater on the far side, design of thermal strain compensation to survive large temperature fluctuations from 100 degrees centigrade to minus 173 degrees centigrade over a lunar day and rim to flow transportation are too difficult. Moreover, Arecibo type foundational elements, support structures and restrained anchors are too heavy. We show here that these challenges can be overcome with LCRT. Thanks to the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission, we now have high resolution imagery of the moon. In the LROC database, there are over 450,000 craters in the 1 to 2 kilometer diameter range that are excellent candidate craters for LCRT. This slide shows some of the crater requirements we focused on, like location, depth, diameter, and interesting requirements like avoiding boulders or outcrops in the crater, a complete crater rim, and level surface inside the crater to help with LCRT's construction. The longitude of LCRT's location should be within 180 plus or minus 45 degrees to avoid RFI from Earth as shown in the image on the right. The biggest challenge in collecting this data is the galactic foreground radiation signal by our own Milky Way galaxy. This foreground is five orders of magnitude stronger than the dark ages signal at the LCRT band. The figure on the bottom shows the galactic foreground signal in the galactic reference frame. The lines show the region of the sky that LCRT would see if it were located at different latitudes on the moon. We would like to avoid the strong signals from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Hence, we selected LCRT's crater near the 20 degree north latitude. We manually surveyed multiple craters and selected this crater. Note the large depth to diameter ratio of 0.21, which helps with suspending both the reflector and the feed inside the crater. Using data from LRO, Changi, Kaguya, and other missions, we now have a good understanding of the subsurface properties of the selected crater. This data will be used in the upcoming RF simulations. Since LCRT only collects data during the lunar night, we need to exquisitely maintain the shape only during lunar night when the temperature variation is only 10 degrees centigrade. Of course, LCRT needs to survive the large temperature swings of the lunar day, but the shape need not be maintained. We now discuss the concept of operations. This concept art made by artist Vladimir Vustansky is not to scale. First, a lunar lander lands in the selected crater. The lander fires the anchors to the crater rim. We first tension the lift wires. Then we deploy the feed antenna. Next, we deploy the reflector. Finally, we calibrate LCRT using a beacon spacecraft. These CONOP steps will be discussed in the following slides. This slide shows the mass budget of LCRT with appropriate margins. Multiple commercial randers can carry this 1.8 tons mass to the lunar surface. Next, we fire the anchors to the crater rim. The design of the anchors and the performance of the projectile deployment system is shown here. The lunar regolith is glassy and angular. Therefore, the lift wires are designed with an abrasion layer since there will be friction at the crater rim during the tensioning process. We use a dual spool system to deploy the feed and reflector. 
This also allows us to control the deployment from the lander in a centralized manner. We are using a log periodic antenna for the receiver feed system. Here we show the design of our feed and the gain patterns at different frequencies. The Forte spacecraft deployed a 9 meter long log periodic antenna in space. Here we show some other designs for deployment. The next step is to deploy the reflector mesh using an origami based approach. Imagine a rotating disk with an embedded mesh at the top of the lander. As we pull along the lift wires, this disk spins and releases constraints, and the mesh unfolds and expands to its full diameter of 350 meters. Our reflector's design is inspired by the AstroMesh antenna, which includes a network of tension cables that support a compliant mesh. We built a one meter model to show this approach of tensioning the wires using gravity loading indeed works well. State of the art mesh manufacturing can provide us with one openings per inch compliant mesh. This will be overlaid on the network of tensioned cables and provide the perfect surface for RF reflection. The contribution of the mass from the tensioned cables and compliant mesh for different number of subdivisions is shown in the left. The proposed architecture of the lift wires for nominal operation is also shown here. This video shows how the active pulley system will be used for deploying the reflector and correct for inaccuracies in the anchor firing process. The deployment of the reflector with the compliant mesh will look similar to this 10 meter diameter star shade deployment shown here. Finally, putting it all together, this slide shows the RF performance of LCRT over all wavelengths. Next, the RF performance of LCRT is perturbed using subsurface regolith models. Note that at the smallest frequency of 4.7 MHz, lunar regolith contributes up to 6% of the signal. Regolith's contribution falls to 0.1% for the highest frequency of 47 MHz. We created an error budget to account for all the inaccuracies in the technology which will be used to build an instrument model for LCRT. We worked with Professor Jack Burns' science modeling pipeline called PyLinux to prove that LCRT can indeed recover the dark ages science signal. We first combined a dark ages signal with the galactic foreground noise, then convolved it with the previous instrument model to get a good estimate of LCRT's measurements. Next, we processed LCRT's measurements to recover the dark ages signal. This allows us to validate that the 350 meter diameter LCRT will indeed recover the dark ages signal in the operational life of one year. To summarize, we have described the LCRT concept and the T technical challenges. If successful, LCRT will provide groundbreaking scientific insights into the evolution of the universe by observing the universe in the poorly explored 6 to 64 meter wavelength band. LCRT has already created a lot of public excitement. Finally, I would like to thank my awesome team who are involved in this effort. Together, we are working towards making LCRT a reality someday. I want to thank you for your time and I am happy to take questions. Please feel free to mail me your questions or comments. Thank you.